If you're anything like me, then your intellectual life will be on a gentle simmer most of the time. So it's gratifying indeed to see so many of you tonight coming to the boil. Welcome. I encountered surprise recently, having expressed disappointment that for one historical figure memorialized here, the commander of the first convict fleet to New South Wales, for him, Christianity had been a personal matter of purely moral refining. My disappointment provoked bafflement among my hearers. The enlivening character of liturgy and devotion may by some be considered a largely clerical preoccupation, communitarian and antiquarian, but hardly the essence of practical, reasonable religion, seemingly changing nothing. Other generations have navigated this differently and seen the space between personal living and God's action quite differently. The wonderful exhibition of the paintings of Jean-Étienne Lyotard at the Royal Academy recently brought me face to face with a famous boil, Charlotte, daughter of the third Earl of Cork, who would never have known her kinsman, Robert, the erstwhile founder of this lecture series. As the only surviving child, the then huge Boyle fortune passed with Charlotte on marriage to the Cavendish family and into Aelia made Chatsworth possible. I apologize to the 15th Earl for this hopeless summary. Such an extraordinary family change of fortune will surely have been a cause of reflection and godly meditation. And the idea of providence, fairly foreign to us, may well have been applied. I hazard that Boyles, Robert and Charlotte, would have had no concept of random, meaningless events. Like Daniel Defoe, writing between these two Boyles, who has his hero, Robinson Crusoe, specifically reflect that his survival when his shipmates are drowned is intended by a generous God and leads to the ultimate rescue of others. This attribution of meaning is not how we generally proceed, except perhaps when it suits us. I'm minded to consider it nothing short of providential that this parish enjoys the liberal and warm patronage of the worshipful company of grocers by reason of an amalgamation following the great fire and the happy proximity of the worshipful company of mercers whose generosity is notable to this venture and in both cases appreciated with heartfelt gratitude. Gresham College does much to advertise this event and tonight are recording proceedings for their own and shortly our website. Thank you. To introduce tonight's lecturer and responder, I'm delighted to hand over to the series able and indefatigable animator, Michael Byrne. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my colleagues on the advisory board, I'm delighted to join with George in welcoming you to this, the 13th in the new series of Boyle Lectures. Our speaker this evening, the Reverend Canon Professor Sarah Coakley, continues the association between these lectures and the University of Cambridge that has developed in recent years. As Norris Holtz Professor of Divinity at Cambridge, Sarah holds the established chair in philosophy of religion at that university. She's previously held positions at the universities of Lancaster, Oxford, and Harvard, and a visiting professorship at Princeton. In 2012, she delivered the Gifford Lectures in Aberdeen, and in 2013, she served as president of the British Society for Philosophy of Religion. Moving with the times, this evening's lecture is only the second boil at which we'll be using a PowerPoint demonstration to accompany the lecturer's presentation. Professor Coakley has also asked us to leave on your seats a short summary of the lecture, which also contains definitions of some of the key concepts she'll be dealing with in her talk. 
And as usual, we'll be giving out a full printed transcript of the remarks as you leave the church. A test will follow. To respond to Sarah Coakley this evening, we're very pleased to welcome Professor, Chris, Professor Christopher Insole from the University of Durham. Professor Insole's recent book, Kant and the Creation of Freedom, a Theological Problem, shows how important features of Immanuel Kant's philosophy were forged out of difficulties he had in reconciling his belief in God as creator with the concept of human freedom. Christopher's broader research work is concerned with the relationship between fundamental metaphysical and doctrinal commitments and patterns of thought in metaethics and practical reasoning. I'm sure he'll explain all of this in layman's terms when he addresses us later. Thank you again for your continued support of this venture. It's now my great pleasure to invite Professor Sarah Coakley to deliver the 2016 Boyle Lecture on Natural Theology in a Changed Key, Evolution, Cooperation, and the God Question. Sarah. Well, it is a very great honor indeed to be invited to give tonight's Boyle Lecture. And I want to start by thanking those who have invited me, and especially Michael Byrne, who has so graciously steered me through all the practicalities in advance of this event under the aegis of the advisory board chaired by Lord Cork and Orrery himself. I am, of course, also delighted to thank the rector, George Bush, for allowing me to stand thus tonight in his pulpit and declaim to you. And finally, I'm particularly indebted to Professor Chris Insole for agreeing to come all the way from Durham to respond to me. I can think of no one in this country whose criticism I would more gratefully crave, and I am certain that I, and we all, are going to learn from his response. As Professor John Headley Brooks brought to your attention in his own fine Boyle lecture of 2010, Robert Boyle's particular concerns in his own day were with the dangers of a form of emerging modern science that might seek to disjoin profoundly significant philosophical and theological questions from his own undertakings. Boyle's insights, abreast of the recent mathematicalization of science, but closely and tightly woven together with his own interests in ethics and theology, were and remain remarkably prescient of intensifying contemporary problems in the interface between science, philosophy, and theology. Thus, in what follows tonight, I want to focus on one particular realm of contemporary science, evolutionary biology, in which a sustained attempt has indeed been made in recent decades to present secular science as if it came unproblematically front-loaded with particular ethical and cultural meanings. I speak here of the contested area of evolutionary cooperation, so-called, and how to explain it. That is, what it means, scientifically, ethically, philosophically, even theologically, and particularly when it is explained mathematically. This will be the central focus of tonight's presentation. As we shall see, the reason this topic has become a lightning rod of theoretical contention in recent decades is that on one rendition, the phenomenon of cooperation precisely supports the selfish gene ideology that has so dominated secular philosophy of biology of late. Whereas on another rendition, it can threaten that ideology at its core. Much is therefore at stake. Let me state in anticipation how my lecture will unfold tonight. I shall proceed in three major moves corresponding to the three sections of the paper. First, I shall provide as clear but as accessible an account as I am able of what evolutionary cooperation is and why its explanation by a new generation of mathematical biologists, those who chart the regularities of evolutionary strategies 
on a mathematical calculus of probability, have come into contestation over whether all such cooperation is explicable in terms simply of individual genetic advantage. The theoretical conundrum here has not only split mathematical and empirical biologists of late, but also divided factions within each of these communities. At base, then, there is a meaning-making impasse arising from a set of significant questions which I shall argue demand philosophical interrogation, demand a probing to what the philosopher R.G. Collingwood once called the absolute presuppositions of the theoreticians involved, which can be held somewhat unconsciously, but with great passion. Secondly, I shall then move to some of the major philosophical issues we have uncovered. These involve debates about ethics on the one hand, what cooperation bespeaks as a potential hard wiring for human ethical behaviors and principles, and metaphysics on the other, what cooperation may tell us about the fundamental patternings and processes of evolution, what constitutes their fundamental state of being and becoming. I shall dare to suggest to you that some of the richest recent developments in the understanding of cooperation actually march philosophically against what has in recent decades become a sort of orthodoxy in evolutionary theory. That is, that ethics as a subject is fundamentally reducible to genetic determinism and the propulsions of genetic selfishness. And concomitantly, that the metaphysics of evolution is a matter of pure randomness, an arena vacated of any intrinsic meaning or purpose. Thirdly, and if I have convinced you thus far, I shall end with a sketch of how I perceive natural theology as a crucially important and continuing cultural project in the, fa in the face of contemporary scientific debates such as this. Now, in order to make this case, I shall have to define, indeed redefine, natural theology rather carefully in order to stave off certain false expectations. Most of you will know from earlier Boyle lectures, especially last year's insightful presentation by Russell Ray Manning, that the term natural theology has accrued a bewildering range of possible meanings in the classic and modern periods. And even the most famous book of that name, Natural Theology by William Paley, which so entranced Darwin in his younger years, is often misunderstood as to its original intention and force. What I most certainly do not want to argue under this rubric of natural theology, and this is important, is that one could move from evidences about cooperation in evolution to an unproblematic public demonstration of God's existence. That would be a foolhardy ambition indeed. And actually, that particular hard-nosed construal of natural theology is itself a sort of modern chimera, as many before me have commented. But even to the brilliantly adjusted version of that modern ambition to prove the existence of God, which focuses on induction and probabilities rather than strict deductive force, and I'm thinking here especially of the magisterial work of the Oxford philosopher Richard Swinburne, who is the most famous exponent of such a position in our generation. There are, I believe, problems about how to tot up the probabilities for God's existence at the end of that game. And that takes us straight back into the realm of what beliefs and presumptions are being brought to the table by the contestants in the first place, and how they may be changed and transformed by reflections on empirical biology and the philosophical questions that it raises. Now, I do not want to fall back either on the much weaker theological alternative to such inductive arguments for God's existence, 
which is often assumed to be the only credible default position left for natural theology now. That is, a preferential and entirely optional Christian interpretation of evolution from an already dogmatically presumed basis in systematic theology and revelation. My proposed alternative, as we'll see at the end, attempts, you may or may not think successfully, to escape between the horns of these dilemma by essaying a subtler and third alternative which focuses on what crucial shifts may happen in the knowing subject itself, precisely in ruminating on the idea of evolution as a whole. For it finally calls forth, I shall argue, a special kind of perusal of the whole, a contemplative one in which spiritual as well as ethical decisions and commitments are entertained and induced. It is in this sense that I shall argue we most fruitfully speak of natural theology today. So much by way of introduction. Now, in order to effect these three major moves within the space of a short lecture, I'm going to have to move not only deftly, but with a certain daring boldness for which I ask forgiveness in advance. I shall then leave it to my kindly interlocutor to expose the inevitable weaknesses and lacunae that may remain. So first section, and by far the longest one, why evolutionary cooperation matters. We must be extremely careful first to be clear what we mean by cooperation in the evolutionary context. The scientific and philosophical literature, even now, is littered with confusion about its precise definition and its relation to altruism with which it is often identified. And this semantic confusion greatly exacerbates the already contentious theoretic debates about its explanation and significance. There is also more general confusion caused when cooperation is used as a term too loosely and colloquially, simply to mean collaboration between different individuals with mutual benefit. For in evolutionary populations, such mutualism clearly furthers the fitness of both partners, and thus its perdurance is not difficult to explain since it helps both of their fitnesses. Whereas the same is not true of cooperation. So what precisely is cooperation then? And why is it so puzzling to the theoreticians? A decent accessible rendition, which is made the more precise when provided with mathematical formulation, runs thus. And I have put these definitions on your handout as an aid. Cooperation is the phenomenon which is encountered right across the evolutionary spectrum of life from microorganisms to humans in which one entity within an evolutionary population suffers loss of fitness and another correlatively gains fitness. In other words, this phenomenon represents a calculus of gain through loss. I lose, you gain. You gain, I lose. What we might in more theologically laden terms call productive sacrifice within an evolutionary population. Now notice, however, and by way of immediate caution, that there is nothing in this initial definition of cooperation that says anything about intentionality. Cooperation is simply an evolutionary phenomenon that happens in various circumstances. And this is what is so interesting and puzzling, since the selfish gene worldview would suggest that such manifestations of unselfishness would naturally be screened out in the processes of evolutionary selection. 
The fact that cooperation is not screened out, but in fact stabilizes naturally in various significant circumstances, is what requires theoretic explanation. But let us not abandon the issue of intentionality either, since in humans, and some of the higher mammals especially, this kind of intentionality is an especially interesting additum to the more generic phenomenon of cooperation as just defined. That is why I prefer to distinguish cooperation in general from altruism as a subset of it in which there is an intentional surrendering of fitness by one individual or set of in individuals in an evolutionary population intentionally for the sake of or out of love or regard for another or others. To engage in altruism so defined will therefore require some level of consciousness, will, and at least rudimentary beliefs to qualify as altruism. And thus, the question of what species other than the human are also capable of altruism so defined, as opposed to unmotivated cooperation more generally, is another issue of extremely interesting debate. Some of the higher mammals, such as dolphins, whales, meerkats, to a slightly lesser degree chimpanzees, they're a bit more boisterous, are incredibly cooperative and show signs of having some form of rudimentary intentionality attached to that. Thus, it seems that something of human altruism is already prefigured, even in its intentional side, in the higher mammals. Now, why, then, has giving an account of cooperation become so paroxysmic of late for empirical and mathematical biologists? The answer lies in the debate about what causes it and how to explain it. And it is the mathematical modeling of evolutionary processes which has proved so fruitful in the last decades in giving a precise account of the surprising prevalence and significance of cooperation alongside defection, which is the technical term used for its opposite, i.e. selfish behavior, in evolutionary populations. The big question here is how the basic movements of mutation and selection in evolution are conjoined with cooperation and defection to structure evolutionary processes. To put it simply and briefly, drawing on an important survey article by the Harvard mathematical biologist Martin Novak, with whom I myself have collaborated now for some years, there are at least four or five explanatory circumstances which have been identified by mathematical biologists as yielding sustained forms of cooperation when we would not prima facie expect it. The first rule for cooperation, as Novak puts it, is the basic one, but also the one where most of the current drama and disagreement is being played out since much depends on how exactly it is accounted for mathematically. So let me now quickly run through these five rules. The first rule, commonly known as kin selection, or sometimes inclusive fitness, explains cooperation in terms of the benefits accrued not to the cooperator itself, who takes the fitness loss, of course, but to its genetic relatives, thus ensuring that individual genetic advantage, also known as selfishness, still does, in a sense, endure through genetic relatives. Following the original insights on this phenomenon by the rather eccentric communist scientist J.B. Haldane, 
It was actually William Hamilton who later attempted to formalize this first cooperative mechanism mathematically, whereby, according to his account, the coefficient of relatedness must exceed the cost of cooperation over the benefit of cooperation. And this simple way of mathematically formulating why cooperation can occur when genetic relatives benefit rather than the cooperator itself came to be called Hamilton's rule. This rule has sustained generations of biologists' investigative careers. It has been a kind of linchpin of theoretical assumption, an absolute presupposition. Imagine the fury then when Martin Novak, the famous E.O. Wilson, who at this point was dramatically changing his mind, and a younger mathematical colleague, Corinna Tarnita, recently and contentiously challenged Hamilton's rule as to its mathematical efficacy. In short, they argued that that particular mathematical way of explaining cooperation by benefit to relatives of the cooperator was bogus. And E.O. Wilson, sorry to go back to him, E.O. Wilson thereby effected a dramatic theoretical volt fass in the process, having been for years one of the prime defenders of inclusive fitness theory and Hamilton's rule. But note that Novak and colleagues do not challenge in their mathematical critique the importance of kin as such as a factor in the evolving of cooperation, because as any empirical biologists will testify of work done in the field, the vast majority of cases of cooperation is witnessed in genetic relations, whether close or remote. That's not the contentious issue. The problem is that in our generation, as mentioned, whole academic careers have been built on the particular mathematical force of Hamilton's rule, along with a set of more hidden philosophical presumptions that have tended to come with it and that I shall comment on shortly. To put it a little contentiously, we might say that for many such biologists, Hamilton's rule has been the key unifying story of their research, a fulcrum of meaning which has in effect replaced the holistic interpretation of nature supplied in many earlier generations by classic natural theology. The fundamental holistic meaning of evolution for them has been summed up in Hamilton's rule. Now let's look at our other rules rather more quickly. The second, third, and fourth rules for cooperation are in a way intriguing variations on the first, but do not intrinsically require genetic relatedness in the same way as the first. The second rule, direct reciprocity, originally investigated by Robert Trivers, urges that if one individual in a population cooperates, another might in due course be drawn to cooperate too, and such might extend a chain of imitative cooperation to some mutual benefit, at least for a while, until defection breaks in once more. Even then, a so-called forgiving strategy may help to re-establish chains of cooperation. The third rule, so-called indirect reciprocity, applies principally in the human realm, although conceivably a rudimentary form of it can also be efficacious in higher mammals in the absence of specifically human language. Here, one cooperates with another whom she may never meet again, but the behavior is observed by others and eventually evolutionarily rewarded because of that. Natural selection thus turns out to favor strategies that base the option to cooperate on the so-called reputation of the recipient. Once human language is in play, this mechanism is particularly effective. 
as we know, reputations spread by gossip and innuendo. As the Harvard biologist David Haig has put it, for direct reciprocity, you need a face. For indirect reciprocity, you need a name. A fourth circumstance in which cooperation can win out occurs in what is now called spatial selection, sometimes called network reciprocity, in which defection does not naturally dominate, as in well-mixed populations, because individual cooperators here form clusters which protect and enhance the success of their cooperation. It turns out that one can graph such clusterings of cooperation and that a surprisingly simple rule determines whether network reciprocity will favor cooperation. The benefit to cost ratio in fitness terms must exceed the average number of neighbors per individual in the cluster. It is with Novak's so-called fifth rule, however, group selection, that disputation sets in again with force. Here it is hypothesized that the focus on the individual cooperator or defector must give way to a group analysis. For even in the fourth rule, the so-called clusterings involved still fundamentally relate to a competition between individuals. In group selection, however, the group is the explanatory unit, not the individual. This is the phenomenon on which Darwin himself had such a notable and prescient intuition in his late work, The Descent of Man. Sorry, there's a bit of skipping going on here. As he put it there, explicitly using the language of sacrifice, there can be no doubt that a tribe including many members who are already ready to give aid to each other and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over other tribes. And this would be natural selection. On this vision of cooperation, a population is divided from the start into groups. And in some cases, groups of cooperators fare better than groups of defectors. The reason for this continues to be debated and much depends on how one models group selection mathematically. It is here that the defenders of Hamilton's rule display their greatest skepticism, given their unshakable commitment to an individualistic and solely kin-related account of all cooperative phenomena. However, as Novak and his colleagues stringently argue, in a competition between cooperator groups and defector groups, pure cooperator groups can indeed be demonstrated to grow faster than pure defector groups. Darwin was on to something here then, even though most theoreticians who remain committed to Hamilton's rule vigorously deny that he was right. Now what conjoins all five of these different evolutionary mechanisms outlined by Novak is what he calls a payoff matrix in which cooperation can be shown to be favored in repeated choices between the two basic strategies of cooperation and defection. And what is particularly fascinating about this discovery, and it's this conclusion that I want to impress on you, even if the details of what has preceded may be a little arcane, is that this mathematical account of the various circumstances under which cooperation can win out, explains the paradoxical fact that whereas defectors always win out initially in a well-mixed population, they do so at the cost of declining average fitness in the population as a whole if too many defect. We kind of intuitively know this as humans. If you have a population of solely selfish behaviors, the selfish behaviors will win out initially, but if you have too many selfish operators, it's not good for the whole group. Defection, in this sense, ultimately undoes itself in excess, whereas cooperation in its various forms is actually the mysterious key to the regeneration of fitness. 
Further, there is intriguing, though unfinished, evidence from the later work of Maynard Smith and Satmari especially, that the great transition moments in the history of evolution, moments when you get a new phenomenon emerging from individually replicating molecules to chromosomes, for instance, or from asexual reproduction to se sexual reproduction, it seems that these are rendered possible only as a result of a phase of preparatory stable cooperation. Cooperation was thus the matrix of these crucial transitional developments. Across the whole history of evolution, it seems, the countervailing propulsion of cooperation has played a central and creative role. Now, as a result, of the mathematical clarification of these pervasive cooperative mechanisms, so-called then, and of their necessity for populations regeneration and flourishing. Martin Novak has gone so far as to describe cooperation as a third principle of evolution, alongside mutation and selection. This claim too, of course, still remains controversial. Yet according to him and his colleagues, together these three principles, mutation, selection, cooperation, can account for the recurring structures of evolutionary processes and thus for certain consistent stochastic regularities within them. They are in effect the fine tuning of evolution. For Novak, the mathematicalization of cooperation has revealed what he calls dynamic or repetitive patternings in evolution, patternings which fan out to include creative and explicable group phenomena. For Novak's detractors, however, staunch defenders all of Hamilton's rule, wishing to explain all cooperation at base as individual genetic advantage, Cooperation is simply another index of genetic determinism amidst, amidst the random flux of evolutionary mutation and selection. For such a position too, even motivated human altruism is reduced to a mere manifestation of genetic determinism. Indeed, I hope this is sufficiently shocking to you, as E.O. Wilson wrote in his earlier days, before his conversion to Novak's position, writing with the philosopher of science Michael Ruse, and I quote, ethics is a collective illusion of the genes put in place to make us good cooperators. Nothing more, but also nothing less. It was that position of Wilson's that played so decisively into Richard Dawkins' hands. Along with a few extra items, the distinctive selfish gene ideology was up and running. But which account of cooperation do we now favor? And on what grounds? All right. The hard-working mathematical bit of this lecture is now over. We are on to cultural meanings. The first part of my lecture has necessarily been the longest, since we cannot begin to understand the current controversy over cooperation unless we comprehend something of the technical and mathematical contours of the theoretic debate. But now it is time to take philosophical stock and to move to my second level of analysis, that of the often buried absolute presuppositions of the contestants, which I mentioned at the outset. For it may by now already be clear that neither the contested mathematics of cooperation as such, nor even the many empirical bio biological evidences which accompany it, can by themselves resolve the meaning-making impasse which we have uncovered in the theorization of cooperation. It may be clear to you already that fundamental ethical and metaphysical issues are at stake and have, then have to be faced, probed, and deliberated upon here. And it is by no means obvious 
that the pervasive and reductive story of the selfish gene is the best explanation philosophically of cooperation when the rich and wide variety of cooperative phenomena from slime molds to humans are considered with an open mind. You may recall that Richard Dawkins felt obliged to add an extra chapter on cooperation in the second edition of his famous book, The Selfish Gene, since the phenomenon might have seemed to raise a threat to his central argument about pervasive genetic selfishness. But on the contrary, argued Dawkins, using rather emotively there the gaulish example of sacrificial blood-sucking bats, nice guys do indeed finish first because, of course, their niceness is really only the propulsion to genetic advantage all along. There we get that ethical reduction move. Yet a mark of the strange difficulty to which this debate has subsequently led is the form which the initial rebuttal of Novak and um, Wilson and Tarnita's critique of inclusive fitness took in an enraged letter to the journal Nature. In it, strikingly, there was no attempt by the 137 signatories, all extremely illustrious biologists, to respond to the actual mathematical critique of Hamilton's rule supplied in the original article. And Novak tells me it is doubtful that many, if any, of these detractors even understood it. But it was enough that, that the hegemony of Hamilton's account of inclusive fitness had been challenged at all. Here was an absolute presupposition the complainants shared about their core explanation of cooperation. And it brought to the surface a host of other, I think, entirely contestable ethical and metaphysical commitments. These are well evidenced, just one example, in an instructive blog by Steve Pinker and friends, which you can find online, The False Allure of Group Selection, in which Pinker reiterates his commitment to a reductive genetic rendition of natural selection, so attractive, he says, precisely because it is so mechanistic. Deploring group selection theorizing as merely fuzzy, he reiterates his accustomed reduction of human ethical sensibility to selfish genetic coding, albeit, he admits, sometimes disguised as altruism under the reputational pressures of indirect reciprocity, Novak's third rule. Yet the problem here, as one of Pinker's interlocutors, Herb Gintis, immediately reposts on the same instructive blog, is that Pinker simply refuses to take seriously the mounting empirical evidence for a widespread, perhaps even universal, basic human sensibility in humans, one which can in no obvious way be reduced to purely genetic propulsion. Humans do, it seems, as increasing anthropological work with um, hunter-gatherers, for instance, in other parts of the world, seem to have very basic moral perceptions which recur repeatedly throughout the globe. Now, the lesson from this revealing interchange between Pinker, Gintis, and otherwise, others, seems to be this. If the strategy of reducing all ethics to genetics is under question, because the purported mathematical demonstration of inclusive fitness is also in trouble, then it surely cannot be that a desperate reassertion of Hamilton's rule on the grounds of a preference for mechanistic simplicity is a convincing ploy of rebuttal by Pinker. Instead, it smacks to me of vicious circularity. In contrast, I urge that the stage is now open for a very rich philosophical debate about the various ethical theories that might best and most convincingly cohere 
with the evidences of evolutionary cooperation and its human motivational variant, altruism. And a debate about what accompanying so-called meta-ethical principles, that is, what it is to be good, a debate about what it is to be good, needs to take place. For it is by no means obvious, as is assumed by most of the contestants in this discussion, that a narrow utilitarian calculus here wins the day. Cooperation happens because I get advantage for myself, or if not for myself, then for my immediate relatives. And that's especially non-obvious once the hegemony of Hamilton's rule is challenged. Indeed, as I argue at much greater length in my own uh, Gifford lectures of uh, 2012, which, is avail which are available online, I think that the evidences that we now have about cooperation and altruism are much better accounted for when we come to ethical theory by looking at some kind of natural law theory associated with virtue ethics in the human, or by looking at some kind of reworking of Kantian theory about a categorical imperative which is hardwired into us out of our evolutionary past, both these theories of ethics seem to me to be much better contenders for accompanying the evidences about cooperation and altruism that I've already surveyed tonight. The debate here needs to go on, and what we're looking for is an argument to the best explanation for these evidences. The great advantage of an evolutionary approach to ethics, of course, is that it has the capacity to explain how certain profound ethical sensibilities are hardwired into our human psyche, seemingly from a more ancient evolutionary source. But what I'm saying is that it would be a grave mistake to conclude from this that all forms of human altruism are explanatorily reducible merely to states of enlightened evolutionary selfishness and short-term utilitarian goals for me and my family. Indeed, what we might call excessive forms of productive altruistic sacrifice are regularly manifested in human culture and have been taught as higher forms of righteousness, both by prophets, Jesus included, love your enemies, pray for those who hate you, and also by philosophers. How we then theorize these, as it were, higher forms of altruism, evolutionarily, whether as meaningless cultural spandrels or as manifestations of a more demanding and universal form of human altruism yet to be fully realized today in response to previously unparalleled global threats of war, terrorism, and ecological disaster is one of the most pressing ethical issues of our time. In short, what I've been talking about tonight is really about whether the human race is capable of responding to the biggest international global crises that we now confront. The point, however, is that that debate can't be settled simply by empirical science. It must be a debate that's joined philosophically but informed by empirical and mathematical science. But it mustn't be foreclosed either by dogmatic and questionable presumptions within the field of evolutionary biology itself. A second and equally important philosophical debate spawned by the evolutionary evidences of cooperation concerns the very way we choose to think about what the pundits call the metaphysics of evolution that is, about its fundamental being or becoming, its basic structures and patternings. We have already noted the penchant in reductive genetic accounts of cooperation to a concomitant foreclosure on these metaphysical questions. Evolution on this view is ex hypothesi, wholly random and unpurposive. The evolutionary tape 
as Stephen Jay Gould once famously remarked, can never be rewound or repeated in any form, certainly not predicted. And it comes with no implicit value or meaning either. But again, the material I have briefly surveyed in the first section of this paper surely already gives the lie to such a dogmatic set of presumptions. Indeed, the intimations of certain forms of structure and even purposiveness in the story I have told seem increasingly hard to deny. Consider once more the discovery that cooperation manifests itself through the whole spectrum of evolutionary life and with remarkably consistent formations and patternings which can now be mathematically modeled. Consider again the suggestive discovery by Maynard Smith and Satmari that at key moments in the evolution of more complex forms of life, stable cooperation formed a vital and productive mark matrix of transition in this larger perspective on evolution's tree of life. A picture of creative repetitious patterning thus emerges at a second and broader level of evolutionary significance. Consider, too, the remarkable behaviors in manifestations of cooperation found already amongst some of the higher mammals, whales and dolphins especially. They have been known, as you may know, to help each other even when uh, one member of their coterie has been fatally wounded. Uh, dolphins will circle the wounded dolphin and try and lift the dolphin away from the source of assault, a propeller of a boat, for instance. These are very extraordinary phenomena. And they evidence powerful cooperative ingenuity and flexibility in the face of multiple threats to flourishing. They already prefigure something of the intentional and empathetic dimensions of developed human altruism. Consider finally again the intentional and empathetic dimensions of developed human altruism, which on occasions may take extended or even wholly unexpected forms to respond to particular cultural and international crises, moving well beyond the immediate genetic or even national group. We do well, of course, always to remind ourselves that manifestations of evolutionary cooperation and altruism are not intrinsically good, per se. Steve Pinker, because he's a skeptic, likes to point out that human cooperation figured in Nazi pogroms, just as it can today, too, in suicide bombings. But that is precisely why these human phenomena beg, as we have already argued, careful, critical, ethical theorization and moral adjudication. There is no naive ethical meliorism implied in my analysis. I certainly don't think that every day, in every way, we humans are getting better and better. That was sometimes the presumption of the Victorian Darwin when he thought about ethics. I think we now know better. What I am urging, however, against all theoretic fashion in evolutionary biology, which still roundly eschews all talk of purposiveness or teleology, is the attribution of certain forms of patterned and pervasive cooperative structure at different levels of the evolutionary spectrum, including the explicitly purposive forms which arise in higher mammal cooperation and then in human altruism. And this presents a big picture, a picture in which cooperation runs all the way down in evolution. To suggest such, of course, is to make a metaphysical proposal about evolution's fundamental ontology, or of evolution's dynamics, as Novak likes to call it. Now, once we get this far, we are already implicitly raising probing questions about evolution as a whole. And this, of course, brings me to my third and last section. And here I shall be brief, but I trust suggestive, perhaps a little uh, contentiously so. 
There is a tradition of spiritual contemplation from the ancient world, which I wish to retrieve in this last section on natural theology. According to this tradition, which had its roots in Platonic and Neoplatonic forms of philosophizing, and then passed into certain strands of early Christianity, a form of spiritual practice is assumed as a necessary complement to scientific, philosophic, or theological reasoning at its broadest. And in the exposition of the great third century Alexandrian theologian Origen, this practice takes a classic threefold form of ascent. There is, for the contemplative first, the preparatory phase termed ethike, in which the Christian's moral sensibility is preliminary sharpened and purified. But then comes the stage which particularly concerns me in tonight's context, and this is called physike, the patient learning of a contemplative posture which seeks to attend to the world as a whole and its distinctive patternings, and thus to intuit what might be a God's purpose in and for it. Finally, and thirdly, there is contemplation proper, enoptike, by which the contemplative is united even more directly with God in God's self. Now, why is this seemingly arcane and completely outmoded originistic tradition of importance for my attempted retrieval of a certain form of natural theology in the context of an assessment of the evidences of evolutionary cooperation? The reason first is that Origen saw in this three-stage contemplative progression not only a kind of ethical purification for the knowing subject at the first stage, but also a sensory and intellectual transformation. To learn to see, and in particular to see the world as a whole, was an act of spiritual undertaking, which could not be hurried in its development but would in due course involve a subtle but profound change in the knowing subject itself, a new integration of the moral, the intellectual, and the affective. Moreover, this new seeing was for origin no mere optional preference or perspective. It wasn't just, I choose to see the world this way. It was, according to him, a growth in actual insight, a new depth of penetration into reality itself. Such was the alignment of contemplative practice, attention to the world and to each other in this philosophical tradition. Now, it is such a practice of contemplative intuition, of physique, seeing the world, or in this case, evolution as a whole, which I want to commend to you once more as a form of natural theology which possibly avoids some of the traps of the available contemporary alternatives mentioned at the outset. This contemplative unification, as I observe the world as a whole, does not, as it's such, pretend to be an argument for God's existence, but instead creatively probes the richness of the human response, noetic, affective, moral, required for any such argument to have final personal force. Even a probabilistic set of cumulative arguments for God, such as Richard Swinburne famously presents, still requires, I suggest, some such extra spiritual response. It's that which finally sways the surveyor of the arguments personally. And it's what the surveyor then draws upon in responding in a way that shows that this understanding of the world leads to particular ethical and spiritual outcomes. To get here, one needs the transformed contemplative gaze. In my Gifford lectures, I actually do present an argument for God's existence from the evidences of cooperation throughout the history of evolution. But natural theology is a term I want to reserve for that moment when one surveys those arguments and chooses to respond to make a difference to one's life in such a response. Moreover, this alternative vision of natural theology is, I think, a particularly creative alternative to a problem that the great Enlightenment philosopher Kant struggled with all his life, And I only put this in in closing because my interlocutor, Chris Insole, is a great expert on Kant. 
Here, Kant bequeathed to us a strangely unresolved question. For him, order or teleology in nature always seemed, in one sense, strangely obvious, even after his critical turn in philosophy. And yet, after that critical turn, he could never finally attribute order or purpose directly to nature itself instead insisting that purposiveness was an arena now reserved only for the realm of the subjective, of the human subject. A characteristic modern split, therefore, opened up between the world considered scientifically and objectively, as to pure reason in his terms, and the world considered as a whole and as if ordained to God, which he reserved for the arena of practical reason. And hence, natural theology, in any available modern sense, eluded the later Kant's grasp. Kant was, of course, absolutely right to stress that the act of perceiving the world as unity is crucially different from the scientific investigation of any one part of it. It is, however, this Kantian gap between the world and itself and the human willing subject which I believe the more ancient contemplative tradition of spiritual sense, as in origin, dares to seek to bridge. The possibility of such an epistemic alternative would, of course, have been denied by Kant himself, according to the dictates of his own particular critical thought. And yet the longing for it, as I read him, still hangs around more than one of his later texts, both the first and third critiques. Likewise, and as I have unfolded in the logic of tonight's lecture, the ethical and metaphysical decisions called forth out of consideration of the workings of evolutionary cooperation are ones that cannot in the first instance be avoided philosophically, granted the complexity and contentiousness of the scientific evidences. But the final tug to see evolution's meaning as a whole goes into this different and less familiar realm. No longer strictly evolutionary science, as surveyed in part one of this lecture, nor yet even philosophy of science and ethics, as surveyed in the second part, although it is evoked and inspired by them both. This is instead a realm of spiritual intuition or spiritual sensation, a realm in which one first simply wonders why there is anything at all rather than nothing, and then learns to wonder at the remarkable possibility that what is disclosed in evolution is divine meaning as unity. Such, at any rate, is the contemplative natural theology alternative, physicae, which I dare to recommend to you afresh. Whilst it does not claim to deliver either a deductive or inductive argument for God's existence as such, what it does deliver is something I think more subtle and spiritually more interesting, a changed perception of the evolutionary whole as suffused with divine meaning and unity of purpose. As such, it represents, I submit, a serious intellectual rival to the unitary meaning deemed by many evolutionary apolog apologists to be supplied by the reductive Hamilton's rule. Indeed, on reflection, we might playfully call that alternative a natural atheology, one in which all meaning is staked on reductive genetic physicalism. Conclusions. It has been the burden of this lecture to insist that natural theology is an undertaking that may continue to have a profound intuitive and spiritual appeal, despite the successive assaults of modern empirical philosophy and science upon it. The current debate about the ultimate meaning of evolutionary cooperation has been taken as a revealing indication and example of this phenomenon. Whilst reductive genetic accounts of cooperation dogmatically expostulate against the idea of any ethical and teleological meaning encoded in it, but ironically thereby subscribe to a unitive anti-meaning posture, I have impenitently argues otherwise. The first lesson we saw here is that science and theology must never eschew the crucial mediating role of critical philosophy 
especially ethics and metaphysics, in any negotiation between the two best disciplines. But even more important is the issue of the particular epistemological status of a natural theological argument such as I have described. I have suggested that a natural theological approach is not of quite the same genre as a straightforward argument for God's existence on the basis of empirical evidences, although it may and should accompany such. But it is not a mere optional theology of nature either, a matter of simply imposing my preordained personal theological preference onto whatever science gives me. Rather, precisely through the arduous task of reflection on the remarkable patternings revealed in cooperative phenomena throughout the evolutionary spectrum, there arises the possibility of a distinctive moral and spiritual response to them. This goes beyond the mere recording of mathematical regularity towards a wrestling with the ethical and teleological questions encoded in cooperation. And it climaxes, as I've argued, in the fundamental idea of what might unify and resolve those questions. It is the spiritual and philosophical force of such questioning which ultimately concerns me here. What does it take to see the world as unified, to see it as God's, if not a personal transformation which involves in me desire and effect as much as dispassionate cognition? This, as I've repeatedly said, is not as such an evidential argument for God's ex existence. And it is not as such a part of evolutionary science per se. Yet, as I trust I may have persuaded you, it is no mere fideism or naivety either. It is instead a unified spiritual thought experiment evoked precisely by critical reflection on evolutionary cooperation and its possible ethical and metaphysical meanings. From here, we are invited into a sustained and demanding contemplative act. In transforming and reordering one to the very possibility of God's suffusive presence in the world, such contemplation may itself evince a new creative posture of hope. And hope which animates greater altruism is something we desperately need in today's world. I trust that something of this has been in the spirit of Robert Boyle. Thank you. There are few theologians today who combine, as Sarah Coakley does, such theological learning and sensitivity with an insightful curiosity and courtesy in relation to disciplines such as evolutionary biology and philosophy. She has presented today and throughout her work a model of how to go about virtuous interdisciplinary thinking, never being tribal, impatient, dogmatic or rushed, but always patient, thoughtful, well-informed and nuanced. I would like to thank Professor Coakley for her lecture today and for her wider contribution to the academy and intellectual culture. In my response, I will first of all draw out a strand of Professor Coakley's lecture with which I am in strong agreement, suggesting ways in which her methodology deserves to be extended. I will then move on to an area where I have some remaining questions about the approach recommended to us this evening. W. H. Auden, in his poem, Unpredictable, but providential, wrote the lines, as a rule, it was the fittest who perished. The misfits, forced by failure to migrate to unsettled niches who altered their structure and prospered. As a thesis in evolutionary biology, Auden's suggestion about the fate of the fittest must, by definition, fail. But as an expose and commentary upon the wider cultural and political misunderstanding of what it means in evolutionary terms to be fit, Auden is exactly on the money. Fitness in evolutionary biology is always a relational term. Where an organism is fit or well adapted relative to an aspect of the environment in which it finds itself, where this environment includes the population, of which the organism is a member. 
Being fit might include being fast or strong or fierce in some cases, but we will be misled if these examples dominate. Being fit is also about having that funny-shaped beak, the misfit, which becomes useful because of a change in the environment, or the moth being the right color, or the snail having a particular banding pattern on its shell. Professor Coakley speaks correctly about the ideology that pervades some secular philosophy of biology, where fitness is read in terms of selfish and individual advantage. This insight could be carried through more aggressively, I think, to a range of cultural misunderstandings of the phrase survival of the fittest. Professor Coakley shows us that our choice of examples, images, lexicon, and metaphors really matter, and that behind this choice lurk unexpressed philosophical and ethical commitments. When emotions are not talked about or explored, they actually do more work and more dangerous work, just so with philosophical and ethical assumptions. Thinking carefully and critically about our choice of language involves as Professor Coakley recommends, an unflinching ethical reflection which has the potential to challenge and transform us. It can also open up the world around us. Cultural depictions of nature and evolution are never neutral and innocent. We know this with self-satisfied righteousness when we watch the YouTube clip of the ghastly Nazi teacher hectoring his 12-year-old pupils about the Darwinian support for National Socialism, as two poor stag beetles not unreasonably have a go at each other because stuffed in a jam jar under a bright light. Observing the awfulness of such clips should not distract us, though, from implicit, albeit milder, ideologies closer to home. Some cultural theorists have found in the gentlest of genres, the BBC Nature Programme, an effective form of social control through supposedly neutral observation in the natural. In the 1980s, nature programs ghoulishly followed ravenous lions roaming the savannah like serial killers, thrillingly completing the aggressive takeover of antelopes. The force of such depictions, some cultural commentators have found, was implicitly to invite an almost moral sympathy with the victim the doe-eyed panic, the throbbing vein in the throat, and then to endorse the difficult message that non-intervention is the only rational and objective course of action. More cooperative and stable aspects of the social life of animals were generally edited out of the final production. Accordingly, we imbibe the message that nature is savage, fierce, competitive, and individualistic, with weaker organisms being consumed, and with the implicit invitation to take this manfully and not to be found weeping on the sofa or writing a letter of complaint to the Times. As to whether such depictions evoke any wider cultural attitudes in the 1980s, in the words of the House of Cards fictional conservative Prime Minister Francis Urquhart, I could not possibly comment. Although I would underline that similar examples have been identified which reflect attitudes across the whole political spectrum. So another recent cultural commentator has found in BBC's Spring Watch, with its constant and exhausting invocations to tiny pieces of inevitably ineffectual activism through interference in the life of tiny creatures, including placing security cameras in bird boxes, a projection of a political left which no longer knows what it is for. So when Professor Coakley invites us to look at the diversity of explanatory models that deserve to be employed when thinking about evolution, she is correct that concepts such as cooperation and even altruism to the point of sacrifice are just as appropriate and descriptive, analogously at least, as terms such as competition and struggle. Furthermore, our choice of lexical field is never innocent, but involves mostly subconsciously philosophical, theological, ethical, and I would add political decisions. I'm about halfway through my response.
But Professor Coakley also intends something far more ambitious in this evening's lecture. And here I have more difficulties. She navigates a ship, avoiding a Scylla and a Charybdis, on the one hand refusing a natural theology which moves from patterns of supposed order in the world to the existence of God. And on the other hand, aspiring to more than a theology of nature, which offers a Christian interpretation of evolution from an already presumed basis in systematic theology and revelation. Now, like many other contemporary theologians, I have been content to picnic on this particular rock, accepting evolution, of course, but relating it to an already presumed set of theological commitments, without trying to suggest that evolutionary biologists might need more teleological or even theological categories in order to do their work. So Professor, Professor Coakley's challenge is disquieting for theologians as well as for biologists, I think. And the atmosphere at the picnic has become rather pensive. But I'm not yet convinced it is safe to jump in the water. And here is why. Professor Coakley is eager to avoid a certain sort of natural enlightenment, natural theology, which attempts an argument for God's existence on the basis of empirical evidences. And indeed, at every stage, the argument presented this evening has been more muted and nuanced than such projects, speaking not of proofs that God exists, but of meaning-making impasses, which reflection upon God and the spiritual senses can illuminate. But I think what characterizes natural theology on the Enlightenment model is something deeper than the move from empirical evidence to the conclusion that God exists, whether this is claimed to be a definite or merely probable result. The pattern underlying Enlightenment natural theology is more this. So first of all, we observe patterns of order in the natural world. And secondly, and this is the often buried but crucial premise, we find it surprising that there is such order. And thirdly, given this surprise, we move in some sense and in some way towards divinity as an explanation for this surprising order. The second move is crucial because unsurprising order, something we could expect to happen upon the basis of naturalistic and scientifically understood principles, hardly cries out for further explanation. The argument presented this evening by Professor Coakley is always poised, nuanced, and subtle. But I am unclear how it will avoid the movement of thought characteristic of Enlightenment natural theology. So we began with observing patterns of order in evolution. Two types of evidence were presented this evening, cases of cooperation and altruism, and the way in which mathematical patterns and structures can be traced in evolutionary development. We then have the claim that on current prevalent models of evolutionary biology, dominated by the ideology of the selfish gene, such cooperation and such patterns are inexplicable, or at least surprising. And finally, we move suggestively, suggestively but emphatically to the categories of teleology and divinity as being a way to resolve a meaning-making impasse. We do not prove God's existence, but we do arrive at a changed epistemic perception of the evolutionary whole as suffused with divine meaning and purpose. Well, what is the problem with such patterns of natural theology? Surprise, sorry, order, surprise at the order, and then the move to divinity. The problem which repeatedly surfaces in the history of ideas is that the reaction of surprise at the order is always vulnerable to better explanations and models, which, if not available now, come along eventually. I am convinced that some of the order that we have been shown this evening, cooperation, altruism, mathematical patterns and structure in evolutionary development might well stretch the capacity of evolutionary biologists who insist on what Professor Coakley calls genetic determinism and the ideology of the selfish gene. And certainly extrapolations from evolution to ethics and politics need to be heavily censored and refuted. But it is not the case that the only two options open to us are a reductive worldview of deterministic selfish genes and the spiritually rich move to teleology, divinity, and the spiritual senses. We should not move too quickly, I fear, from the failure of the former 
to a presumption that the latter is required. We need, first of all, to stop off en route and hear some more considered and nuanced accounts from the more reflective and philosophically sophisticated quarters of evolutionary biology. And we're in the home straits here. If we visit these quarters, we can find accounts of why the evidence of order presented this evening, cooperation, altruism, and mathematical patterns and structures in the development of evolution, is in fact not surprising and adequately explained and investigated by current models in the discipline. Putting it briskly, this is how the story might go. Fitness is not at the level of the individual at all, but nor is it at the level of the group. Rather, we have to go below the level of individual organisms. Fitness is at the level of a specific trait, the funny-shaped beak, that lends itself to survival and reproduction in a particular environment. Now, any specific fitness, then, is a propensity to produce a specific outcome. So one cannot talk about a propensity without specifying what it is for. This seems obvious, but it has important implications. So, for example, one trait can contribute to the propensity of an organism to have X number of descendants after one generation. Or it can contribute to the different propensity of an organism to have Y number of descendants after two generations, which is different from the propensity of an organism to have Z number of descendants after some other specified number of generations. Because the selfishness of the genetic trait works at such a micro level, far below any individual, it should be clear that it has no immediate application for ethics, psychology, or politics. Furthermore, there is no theoretical reason to be surprised if some of the traits in the mix contribute to altruistic and cooperative actions in various senses of these terms, which have been so helpfully teased out for us this evening. Indeed, it would be strange if they did not. And because different traits contribute to an organism's propensity for survival and reproduction with different degrees of success, depending upon how many generations one takes into account, and given that a major part of the environment is the population of similar organisms, we need not be some surprised if some traits that lead to cooperative and altruistic behaviours win over in the long run, at least in certain environmental conditions. So in other words, a cluster of traits might contribute to behaviour which is costly to an individual organism's ability to survive or reproduce, but those traits might nonetheless endure because these traits improve fitness over many generations. Nor need the mathematicized patterns and structures that can be mapped upon the development of evolution cause any meaning-making impasse. Once we understand that it is the propensities to fitness at the level of traits, which are the causal mechanisms, while mathematicized patterns are descriptions of the cumulative outcomes of these causal processes. So there is nothing spooky in the mathematical pattern. And the, matter, the pattern does not itself cause or feed back into evolution any more than mathematical patterns in divorce rates directly cause any particular marriage breakdown. So I agree with Professor Coakley that we need good philosophy to make sure concepts do not drift anachronistically and that we need good evolutionary biology. I'm not yet convinced, though, that evolutionary biology, just to be itself, and to do its limited but important task, needs the categories of theology. When embarking between Scylla and Charybdis, Professor Coakley commented that she did not merely want to offer a theology of nature, a Christian interpretation of evolution from an already presumed basis in systematic theology and revelation. In some ways, I found this the most remarkable and humbling statement in the lecture. If I had merely done such a thing, I would consider it a successful life's work. And in my estimation, this is in fact what Professor Coakley has achieved and done so marvelously. It also seems to me that to do such a thing is very fitting and traditional. Thomas Aquinas reflects upon all sciences that deal with penultimate matters in relation to God, but he does not therefore insert specific theological content into these sciences not least because they are precisely limited to penultimate matters. 
In my view, Professor Coakley provides the best Christian interpretation of evolution in our generation, the most informed about evolution and theology, the most textured and differentiated, and the most spiritually moving. Only someone of Professor Coakley's stature would be disappointed not to have done more. That with huge and heartfelt thanks to both professors for animated and thoughtful presentations and for their generous time and application involved in preparation brings tonight's proceedings to a conclusion. We are very much in their debt. I'm happy to announce that the Boyle Lecture 2017 will be delivered here on the 29th of March. The lecturer will be Professor Robert J. Russell, the founder and director of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, and the Ian G. Barber Professor of Theology and Science in res Residence at the Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley. A response to that lecture will be given by the Lord Williams of Oystermouth, the Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and lately Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. Thank you so much for your presence and your attention.